to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855. 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The writer Jude said, Beloved, while I was very diligent, to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. We welcome you today to our study of fundamentals of the faith. Specifically today, we're thinking about the fundamental idea of standing up for and defending the faith against error which does so much damage to the souls of men and women worldwide. You know, as we think about the idea of defending the faith, the very idea of controversy itself is something that most of us really don't like. We don't like disputing or debating or, or much contention or, or disagreement. We don't like strife and argumentation a whole lot. You know, the idea of controversy itself means something that's turned in the opposite direction. And we'd rather like for people to agree with us rather than have to face someone who takes a different idea than we do. And you know, as we think about this idea of defending the faith, we don't like controversy, usually because it makes us feel uncomfortable. And it makes us feel uncomfortable because we want to be liked by everybody. And we're afraid that somebody's going to get angry with us, or maybe somebody doesn't have all the facts. And, and some people associate standing up for the truth and controversy with not being as loving as we ought to be. Friend, as we think today about defending the faith, there's no doubt Jesus had people who disliked Him. There's no doubt that people became very angry at times with the Lord and Savior. So much so that that was one of the main motivating factors. People put Him on the cross. There were those who didn't have all the facts and, and yet Jesus still presented the truth in opposed error. And no one would ever say Jesus wasn't loving when He stood up for the truth. And friend, that's the same for Christians today. When we defend the faith, when we contend earnestly for the truth, we're not being mean or unkind. We're simply trying to let God's truth and God's Word shine forth. Galatians 4.16 says it this way, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? When Paul spoke to Christians in Galatia, some of whom were greatly confused and in error about mixing the old law and the new law, 
Was he becoming their enemy when he spoke the truth of God? Absolutely not. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. The proverb writer said in Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 5. Now, as we think about the basis and what it is that causes controversy, I'm reminded of Benford's Law of Controversy, which was expressed by Gregory Benford in this way. He said, controversy is passion inversely proportionate to the amount of real or true information available. Controversy becomes passionate in an inadvertent way, uh, inversely proportionate to the amount of facts somebody may have. If we stand behind the truth, and if we're going to simply say what God's Word says, should we be passionate about speaking up for the truth and opposing error? Absolutely, Christians should be passionate about that. Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, We're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we are to expose them. Why is it that Jesus spoke so passionately about the resurrection in Mark chapter 12? They had this long argument with a woman who had the seven husbands. Whose husband is she now? And Jesus passionately said, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. In heaven, they're neither married nor given into marriage, but they're like the angels. And He goes on to show, because the resurrection is such a vital part of Christianity, He spoke passionately about the error they held there and defended God's truth. Now, Let's think for a moment about what it is. What causes us to have to, at times, defend the faith and stand up for truth? Sometimes error and controversy occurs. Maybe because rumors or, or gossip cause it to be unnecessary. Maybe somebody's heard something or somebody told somebody something and, and that kind of went around the chain through everybody and, and before the long it's not even true. Maybe it started out with some sense of truth, but has been so exaggerated or gone through the gossip chain so much that it's really not true. Friend, when we think about rumors and gossip causing error, Paul spoke about in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, he said, you've got to stand up and te make sure to teach the, the one gospel. Don't give he heed to fables or endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in the faith, the fables, the endless genealogies, the rumor and gossip maybe that had been spread there, the ancient history, which wasn't a source of tradition, caused controversy in the first century. Other times, it's a failure to accept the facts that causes controversy. God makes clear in the Scriptures what's true. Jesus said the truth will make you free. John 8 verse 32. We know that God's Word is truth. John chapter 17 verse number 17. And, and that truth is the only source we need to be saved. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of Him who called us. And so when there are people who try to promote other facts, whether it be church history, whether it be oral tradition, whether it be the, the books of men. And those facts oppose Scripture and people are not willing to accept those. Controversy naturally comes when we don't accept the facts that are plain in the Scripture. Another reason that we often have to defend the faith is because in some situations, prejudice and pride can cause controversy. You see this clearly in the ministry of Jesus. As Jesus is teaching from the old law that the old law itself has been done away with, encouraging people to follow the new law, you've got this whole idea of circumcision and people wanting to be the seed of Abraham. And Jesus clearly teaches that circumcision does not avail in New Testament Christianity. That the old law of Moses and seed of Abraham, He is the seed of Abraham. But they're having been brought up that way, being prejudiced toward it for so long, they couldn't get over the problems that existed in their own mind, even though the facts were very clear. Friend, when we think about controversy, we've got to ask ourselves, is personal bias and prejudice and what I like or don't like playing a factor in my understanding the truth? Friend, whatever the controversy is, and whatever causes it, we've got to deal with controversy in the scriptural way. 
whether it's disagreeing over the Scripture or what oral tradition and Scripture might say and how we need to let the Bible have it say or whatever it may be. The answer is always to deal with it in a scriptural approved way and let God's Word have the say. In doing that, let's then recognize what are some attitudes and motives that are needed from someone trying to stand up for and defend the faith. And friend, no doubt, listen carefully, the main attitude that is needed is genuine love. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 verses 3 through 5, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And again, he said, don't give heed to fables or endless genealogies, which are going to cause disputes. And then he said this, the purpose of the commandment to charge some to teach no other doctrine is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. When we stand up for truth, when we try to teach God's truth and, and oppose error, how do we do that? Love from a pure heart from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Luke 19.10, Jesus is the great example of this. Jesus often had to stand up for truth, but Jesus came for the sole purpose of seeking and saving the lost. No doubt His motivation was love. Jesus said, a, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. And yet Jesus at times even had to oppose his own disciples for some of the things they may have espoused. When we're dealing with controversy, let's let brotherly love continue. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Let's realize we've got to even love our enemies. Matthew 5, verses 44 through 46. And so when we talk about this idea, we're talking about the words of Ephesians 4, verse 15. I've got to, and anyone who stands up for truth, which all of us at times must, we've got to speak the truth in love. Now there's no doubt, truth must come first and truth must reign supreme. And, and I understand God's Word is the absolute source of all truth. Psalm 119, 160, but as I speak the Word of God, do I want to be mean and hateful and unkind and, and demeaning to people? Of course not. I want to speak the truth in love, meaning that our motivation is love and that love ought to be exhibited in the way we say the things that we do, and that we're really trying to help people understand God's Word. Ultimately, another attitude that is needed in trying to stand up for and defend the faith is we need a desire to please God, not men. I want you to think about Paul's example in Galatians chapter 1. As Paul thought about his past life and how he had been often caught up in tradition and the things of men, Paul made this great statement, and I want you to listen to the words of Galatians chapter 1, and notice what the Apostle Paul says in verse number 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul said, am I trying to persuade God or men? Who am I trying to persuade? Men? Am I still trying to please men or God? He's trying to please God. Therefore, he wants to speak the very words of God. Our desire, and please understand, God wants all men to be saved and Christians do as well. But our desire in defending the truth and standing up for what's right is to make God happy. I want to stand behind and stand firmly upon God's Word. I want to do that in an attitude and motivation of love, but ultimately, when I think about who's happy or who's unhappy, my number one concern is, does this make God happy as we stand up for the truth in the way that He wants us to? You know, another motivation that we need in, in defending the truth is, we need first to seek the truth. I want to make sure I'm seeking truth first above all else. Truth must reign supreme. Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If it's truth that sets men free, then in defending God's truth, I want to seek the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to stand behind truth. Proverbs 23, 23, the writer in the long ago said, Buy the truth and sell it not. Have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth is the, the question Paul asked to those in Galatia. And friend, as we've mentioned, it is the Word of God that is the source of truth. Not my feelings, not my opinion, 
not your feelings and not your opinion or anybody else's. Jesus prayed to the Father in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John in verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, are there other attitudes that are needed in dealing with controversy and defending the faith? Absolutely. Kindness goes a long way in dealing with controversy. Do we, even if we disagree with somebody, even if we recognize somebody is teaching blatant error about the Scriptures, do I still want to be kind and respectful of that person who's been created in the image of God and who has an eternal soul? Sure I do. Proverbs 15:1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. Ephesians 4 verse 32, We're to have kindness. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4, kindness is directly connected and tenderness is directly connected to love. And so even when we may passionately stand up for the truth and even when we say what God says and oppose error, can we do that in kindness? Sure. Will it always be deemed, looked at as kindness? It may not be. But if our motive and attitude is to be kind and loving and speak the truth. That's the things that God Himself is concerned with. Also, when we think about defending the faith, friend, we've got to have the attitude that I am going to contend earnestly for the faith. Jude verse 3, Jude wanted to write. And he wanted to write about the common salvation, but there was a problem that compelled him. Though I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary. There was a need. I found it necessary to exhort, to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I've got to be willing to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5 verse 11. I, I, if I know the truth and if I want to do it in a kind and loving way, but if I never have the courage to stand up, I'm missing an attitude and a motivation that I need. God needs His people to, in kindness and love, stand up and do battle for the truth. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul would say in 1 Timothy 6, verses 12 through 18. Defend the faith. It's been delivered. And Jude gives the reasoning, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Friend, this right here, this system of faith, in the New Testament Scriptures, this is all of God's revelation. There isn't going to be anything else. It was once for all delivered to the saints and God needs us. He wants us to stand up for the truth. But friend, as we think about the idea of salvation, let's realize just as importantly in our defending for the faith, we need the attitude and the motivation of we're doing this. We're standing up for truth for the motivation of the salvation of souls. Matthew 9 verses 36 through 38. Jesus looked down upon the people from where He was sitting and he, he saw them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus turned to His disciples and said, Truly, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts will send out laborers into His field or His harvest. Why did Jesus oppose the religious elite? Why did He say things that made them so mad that they ultimately sent Him to the cross? Jesus did it because He wanted people to be saved. Why did Jesus say to His disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel? That gospel was going to oppose religious error at times. Jesus wants all men to be saved. And that's got to be our motivation. Friend, the motivation cannot be to beat somebody over the head with the Bible, if we can use that language. The motivation cannot be to make ourselves look good, to feel better about ourselves, to give ourselves some kind of sense of religious approval. No, our motivation in standing up for truth must be the salvation of men and women's souls. Do we really believe, think about this, those who are in religious error, those who have been taught ways of salvation that are not correct, those who are living lives that some have pawned off on them as religious, that are living in immorality. Do we really believe those people are going to be lost? Does that motivate us then to stand up for and teach the truth? Friend, as you think about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His willingness to 
stand up for truth and defend the faith. There's no doubt that Jesus at times was viewed as stepping right into the mire of controversy headlong. Jesus did that in certain areas. He did it as it related to salvation. For example, Jesus taught in John 14, 6, opposed to the many ideas that the Jews had, opposed to the ideas the Greeks and the idolaters had and the Romans had. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. In a world where there was a, a pluralist idea and many ways of salvation that people thought were available, Jesus boldly stood up and whether it be controversial or not said, I am the way, the only way to the Father. Acts 4 verse 12, nor is there salvation in any, in any name, any other name, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As it relates to matters of salvation, when people go out and teach doctrines that the Bible clearly teaches are not correct, all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, the Bible says faith only won't save. James 2 verse 24, when people make up these ideas about salvation and, and, and as they've gone around the country and said, all you've got to do to be saved is say the sinner's prayer. And you turn to the pages of your Bible and that prayer isn't even in there. Friend, we need to oppose that type of error by teaching God's simple plan of salvation. Jesus said in John 3 verse number 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Friend, we've got to, as Jesus did, Jesus stood up for and defended God's truth on matters that related to worship. A woman came to Jesus with a question. She said, uh, we Samaritans, uh, us over here, we've heard that you worship on Mount Gerizim. Jews say you've got to worship in Jerusalem. I want to know, where do you really worship in essence? And Jesus said, it's not the place in essence. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Her idea wasn't right necessarily, nor was the Jews' idea right necessarily. Jesus presented the truth on the matter about worship and stood up for that. Jesus did that even to Satan himself. Matthew 4 verse 10, uh, verses 9 and 10, Satan came to Jesus and he said, uh, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus stood up for truth. You shall worship the Lord your God. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Christians must stand up today and defend the pattern of worship in the New Testament. That is to be in spirit and according to the truth. That it is on the first day of the week that Christians come together to worship God, to sing, to pray, to give, and to take the Lord's Supper. Acts 20, verse number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. That, that Christians today are to sing and make melody in their heart. God hasn't asked us in the New Testament age to have an organ or a band or a, a ten-piece rock band or a piano up there. God wants me to sing and make melody in my heart. There's the place that I'm to, to sing from the heart and make melody with our voices as we teach and admonish one another. Colossians 3 verse 16 and Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 19. You know, Jesus was also viewed controversially and had to defend the faith when it came to difficult discussions like marriage, divorce, and remarriage. There were opposing views in Jesus' day on this subject. And so the Jews want to know, what does the rabbi, what does the master teacher say? And they come to Jesus with a question. Can a man divorce his wife for just any reason? One camp said yes among the scholars of the day. Another camp said no. What do you say, Jesus, from the beginning? It's not so, Jesus said. Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning and says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Should you divorce your wife for any reason? Of course not, Jesus said. And then he said in Matthew 19, 9, But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for fornication and marries another, commits adultery. Friend, it's not unkind. And it's not unloving when we say 
what Jesus said right there. The one and only scriptural reason Jesus gave to divorce was fornication. And then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry. You know, those things sometimes are viewed as unkind and unloving. My friend, that's not the way it is at all in Scripture. We say these things because we love people and because we want them to go to heaven. One of the things that Jesus spoke so plainly about that has become rather controversial and that we must defend the faith for today is the one true church you read about in the Bible. Friend, Jesus said, I will build my church. How many churches and whose church did Jesus build? Listen again. I will build my church. Matthew 16, verse 18. It belongs to Christ, and it's singular in origin. Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is but one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20. There are many members, yet but one body. Colossians 3, verse 15. We've been called into God's love and mercy. We've been called into one body, and be ye thankful. One church, one body. It belongs to Jesus. He built it, and denominationalism is contrary to the teaching of Christ. Paul said to those in Corinth who are trying to promote denominationalism, let there be no divisions among you. Is it unkind to say denominationalism, the naming religious groups after men, the following of teaching of men is not according to God's will? Of course not. We say that in love because the Bible teaches there's one church. The Bible teaches how to get into that one church and the Bible teaches only those in that church. When Christ comes back are going to go and be with the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 verse number 24. And so today we encourage Christians. We stand up for and we defend the truth because that's what God wants. But we must, and this is our motivation and our desire, we want to speak the truth in love. Friend, if truth is not first, all else fails. But if truth is first and there's no love, we have a hard time reaching folks. May God help us to have the courage to truly defend the faith. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee 37111.